mathematics is full of notation. And this is our chance to refresh ourselves on some standard notation that we'll use throughout the course. The first one you'll have seen, I'm sure, is absolute value. And we just remind ourselves that the absolute value is represented by vertical lines surrounding that which you wish to take the absolute value. So the absolute value of x, vertical lines around x, uh, returns the value of x with the sign removed. So if x is positive or 0, it returns x. Um, if it is negative, it's going to strip away that negative sign and just return the positive version of itself. So if x is negative, it returns negative x. In this example, we see that we take the absolute value of negative 17.53. It's going to return 17.53. Absolute value always returns a positive value. The math library holds a mathematical operation that will return the absolute value of whatever you pass it. So if we were to, uh, as is done here in this example, call math.abs of negative 17.53, the value that's held in our variable absval uh, is positive 17.53. So it does the work for us. Another bit of notation is that of floors and ceilings, not the house kind. So the ceiling represented as shown of a real number x is the smallest integer that is greater than or equal to x. So the ceiling is always in a room, is always at or above you. Um, and the same is true with the ceiling function of x. It's going to be the smallest integer that is greater than or equal to x, but it will be an integer. So for instance, if we take the ceiling of 17.53, it will be 18 because 18 is the smallest integer that is still greater than or equal to 17.53. The floor of x, on the other hand, is the largest integer that is less than or equal to x. So the floor is always below us. Um, it's at or below our feet, right? And the same is true for the floor of a number. It's the largest integer that we can find that's still at least equal to or below the number itself. The math library also allows us to do ceiling and floor functions, and they're called by using math.seal or math.floor in Java. The next bit of notation is exponents. So when we look at exponentials, we talk about raising a number to a power. We'll first consider raising a number to an integer power. We define raising a number to the power of zero as being equal to one. So for any real number b, if I raise b to the power of zero, that's defined as equal to one. For any other uh, non-negative integer n, uh, this is defined as b times b times b times b n times over. So for instance, if I have the number two raised to the third power, it's equal to taking two times two times two, th those three times, which gives us a value of eight. Uh, b to the n is also referred to as the nth power of b. So in our example, two to the third, this is the third power of two. Eight is equal to the third power of two, or the third power of two is equal to eight. In this example, b is called the base, n is called the exponent. So in our example, two is the base, three is the exponent. Exponents can be done as well in Java, and for that we use the math library once more, and we use math.pow. And we first give it the base, b, and then we pass as an argument n, the exponent. We can also raise numbers to a rational power, and for that uh, we see that b to the 1 over n, we remind ourselves, is the nth root of b. And the nth root of b takes a value y, where y is the number such that y to the nth power is equal to b. If this is a refresher for you, it might be something worth exploring. Being comfortable with exponents is really important. If we wish to raise b to a rational power, we can also do that and make use of what we've just learned above. So we know that b to the 1 over n is the nth root of b. We're going to take that nth root of b 
and multiply it by itself m times. And what we get is the nth root of b raised to the mth power. Uh, and we can also do this by using that math.pow function. 3 to the 1 half is the same as the square root of 3, which is the second root of 3. Typically, we don't include a 2 if we're just taking the square root. The square root is always just written as the, the root itself. An example taking it to a fractional rational power, 4 to the 2 fourths power is the same as the fourth root of 4 squared. Uh, or the fourth root of 16, and the fourth root of 16 is equal to the number such that it raised to the fourth power is equal to 16. Well, two to the fourth power is equal to 16, so our answer is two. If we write the root of three without explicitly indicating that we are taking a specific root of three, we are intending to take the square root or the second root of three. And this is just common practice. Sometimes we see a number raised to a negative power. So if we have a number x less than 0 and we have a base b raised to the exponent x, this is equal to 1 over b to the minus x. And this brings it back to a positive power. So in the example 2 to the negative fourth, that sets it equal to 1 over 2 to the 4th, which we now have come to understand. So this becomes 1 over 16. There are many properties surrounding exponentials, and we'll see a listing of a few of these. So we remember that b to the 0 is always equal to 1, b to the 1 is equal to b, and we can define all the others based on those. So b to the x plus y, if I have b raised to the power x plus y, that is actually b to the x times b to the y. If I have uh, b to the x and I raise that whole thing to the power y, this is the same as b to the x times y. So in the example in red below, if I have 2 to the third all squared, this is the same as 2 to the power 3 times 2, or 2 to the 6, which is 64. And finally, if I have uh, the product of two numbers, a times b, all raised to the power x, I can rewrite this as a to the x times b to the x, and break things down into a way that makes sense for us. The flip side of exponentials are logarithms. Everything in mathematics has a way to undo what we've just done. Think of this like a Rubik's Cube. If I were to turn one face to the right, if I want to undo that, I rotate that same face to the left. And with exponents, the way that we undo the work done by raising something to a power is take the logarithm of it. And so for a positive real number not equal to 1, and any real number x greater than 0, we define the logarithm base b of x, which we write log b of x, as um, equal to y, where y is a real number such that if we raise that base b to the exponent y, we get back x. And so this is finding, uh, essentially finding the way to undo the exponent. It's assumed that you've had exposure to logarithms through your high school curriculum. And if you need to explore this further, this is something that we can do within tutorials and, and office hours. So logarithms, just like exponents, have many properties, and many of them match up with each other. In fact, I would give you the task of exploring how these properties relate to, even in the order that I'm demonstrating them, to those that I gave you for the exponents. Take log base b of 1. What I'm asking is, what is the power that I have to raise b to such that I get back 1? So the answer to log base b of 1 is 0. I don't even know what b is. I know that it's some positive real number, but 
I know that if I take any base B and I raise it to the zero power, I get one. And so I know that my answer here is zero. Likewise, if I take log base B of B, I'm asking what power must I raise the base B to to get B? Well, I know that B to the one, B to the first power is B. And so my answer is one. The next follow similarly. So in the event of log B of X times Y, I'm saying what power do I have to raise B to to get X times Y? Um, and I suggest you follow through from the previous example to justify to yourselves why this is log base B of X plus log base B of Y. So the bottom property is one that we might need to make use of if we wish to work in a different base. If I see that I have a, a log base B of X and I want to think about it in a different base, I can do that by translating that and saying it's equal to uh, in my new base C, log C of X over log C of B. Um, and this is really useful if we wanna work in a different base. So what about these bases? Bases in computer science are interesting because in mathematics, you've seen log X written without a base, and we've always assumed that it was base 10. But we've seen earlier that all of the information stored within a computer is stored as a sequence of bits. Bits are always held as zeros or ones. Zeros and ones in a sequence form binary numbers, base two. And so while in mathematics we assume that it was base 10, in computer science we assume that we're working base two. And sometimes we write log x missing the o, so that lgx. And so log eight, we're suggesting that you're working base two and we don't explicitly state the two. Um, and so even when you see within computer science log X, sometimes it's assumed that they're working base two. So in this case, there is a bit of a workaround and we have to use that last property. In Java, the log is working in a different base. And so if I want log base two of eight, returned by a Java program, I actually have to do that base conversion and return it by taking the log of eight over the log of two. Well, that's it for now. I'm Dr. Angela Siegel, and I'll see you again next time where we look at numbers, parity, and have a bit more fun as we step into sets.